all need to know why we're here. Who are these people in the gray golfers? So Miss Jennifer will do that for us. Let's please welcome her. Woo! Thank you, Isan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jennifer Da Silva, and um, I'm so pleased to have each and every one take time out of their busy schedule to join us tonight. We are the Grotius Law Firm, a firm under the University of Namibia, under our legal aid clinic. Um, please allow me to introduce our members. I would like to start with our manager, Jackie Hamunyela. Lucia Shader. Marius Falun. Justina Erastus. Tamba Katombo. Fadzai Musodzwa, Isan Patoko, Deheshi Hafela, Pohamba, sorry, Anina Uistazen, Alina Shikongo, Stain Silvanus, Karen Lee, Rebecca Gontes, Frida Akawa, August Shingenge, Saima Hashipala, Rejoice Sakes, and I am Jennifer Da Silva. All right, we are confident that um, tonight's di discussion shall contribute immensely to the ongoing debate regarding the propriety or otherwise of these regulations. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Mr. Silva. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So now, today we have a panel discussion and we would not be here without our panelists. So we would please call Ms. Jackie Hamunyela to introduce the panelists for today. Ms. Jackie? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jackie Hamunyela and I am the Grocious Firm Manager. So today I have been tasked to introduce this wonderful panelists that are sitting here in front of us and if it was not for them, this panel discussion would have not been possible. Allow me to welcome our moderator or to introduce our moderator, Mr. Steve Ndorokazi. He was selected as the best SEDEC television journalist in 2011. He is an admitted legal practitioner of the High Court of Namibia, and he is currently the head of the Strategic Communication Stakeholder Engagement and Taxpayer and Education at the Namibian Revenue Agency, NAMRA. Please give him a hand of applause. <laughs> the very, very first panelist is Mrs. Patience Canalelo. She is the Chief of Legal Risk and Compliance Officer at Mobile Telecommunic Te Telecommunications Company, which is MTC. Please give her a warm round of applause. <laughs> Our second panelist is Ms. Albertina Itana, who is the Acting Head, Legal and Regulatory Affairs at Telecom. Please give her a hand of applause. Our third panelist is Ms. Rusan Tinda, a manager of corporate advice and legislative drafting at Communications Regulatory Authority of Namibia, CREN. Please give a hand of applause. <laughs> our next panelist and one of our group members, Ms. Karen Lee, who is a final year law student at the University of Namibia. 
our next panelist who will be joining on via Zoom because due to unforeseen circumstances, he cannot be here with us today. Mr. Frederico Lynx, who is a research associate at the Institute for Public Policy Research, focusing on, amongst other things, government's issue, anti-corruption strategies, and democracy and elections. Please give him a warm up, a round of applause in his absence. And then the next panelist, the only man that you can see or he's dressed as the place where he works, Inspector Joseph Abbott, who is a legal officer at the Namibian police. And then our last panelist for today's panel discussion is Mr. Apollos Shimakaleni, who is a practicing lawyer and the sole proprietor of Apollos Shimakaleni Lawyers. Please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. So now for the main event, why we are all here tonight, the panel discussion, we'll be discussing part six of the Communications Act, which also talks about SIM registration, surveillance, and data collection. So please, for the main event, guys, please pay attention, enjoy, you know, and ask questions after the discussion. So here we go for the main event. Let me welcome Mr. Ndiv Torokade, who will be our moderator for this event. That wasn't me. Uh, it's Josie Jose over there. So, good evening. How are we? Uh, all right. Uh, my name is Yaruke Kuro, Stephen Dorokade. I'm giving you three options. You can choose which one you can use for the evening. Uh, but all of them are, are acceptable. Uh, when uh, Tuafeni uh, contacted me, and asked me whether I'll be able to play this role, the, the answer was an obvious yes. Uh, because when he mentioned where he was coming from, I remembered a few years back when we were in a similar position that you guys are in uh, this evening. And back then we were discussing, we had an idea of hosting a, a debate. Uh, but it was not just going to be a debate, we were thinking that we were taken on a school, and we took on Aish Pena Secondary School in Katatura. And we're saying, we are just not going to introduce a topic to them that they're going to discuss. But we'll actually have a, a clinic where we find people that are well acquainted with the skills around debate, impart those skills on those learners, and then on the main day, have the debate. As if that was not enough, somebody from our group then decided, but who's going to be the key speaker for the evening? or for the afternoon, because it, ours was held in the afternoon. And then we felt, but any of us can speak. Well, why should we even bother around who we can invite as a guest speaker? And then somebody brave from the group then said, how about we invite the Chief Justice? Chief Justice? Yes, the Chief Justice, uh, Peter Shibute himself. And then we went with the idea. We invited him. But as we were preparing this invitation letter, we didn't think it was, he was even going to respond to it, let alone being present at the event. But he was present. He attended. What I got from there was that the generosity and the kind gesture that he extended to us, those of us that received it, must just extend onwards to others. And that's why I'm here this afternoon. But thank you for considering me. Now, with that said, obviously, I use that opportunity to say so much because I know that I'm not going to be doing a lot of talking. <laughs> the gentlemen and the ladies that are here are the ones that are really going to engage us onto the subject matter. Now, our, our topic this evening is one that affects all of us because when they were launching the SIM registration, the Communication Regulatory Authority of Namibia indicated to us that about 2.2 million of us are using mobile phones. And that, those were data by the, the end of February, uh, April this year. 
So we are all affected one or the other. Now our concern should be, when this takes effect, how much of that would they actually take away from the rights that we should be enjoying? Amongst the many rights, obviously the right to privacy. And that's really is our discussion this evening. I think much of us would really understand why they're doing it, at least some of the reasons for why they're doing it. But the question really is, why are you doing that? How much are you really taking away from what we should be enjoying? And hopefully this discussion will enlighten us and inform us and then ensure that we're able to comply with whatever the regulation as well as the, the act that really uh, give life to that regulation provides for. I think it's only appropriate that to start the discussion, I should allow Ms. Uh, Rusan Ntinda, who is representing CREN, to really get us going. And in this initial intervention, you, you can speak to us about the basis for why this is even happening. Why are we even talking about it? Why, uh, why are you doing this? Hello? Okay. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Rusa. So um, I think you, should, you will need to repeat the question because I got distracted by the mic now. SIM registration. Mm. Why are we even doing it and what is the basis for it? Um, the basis for it is that um, Namibia has been having the Communication Act since 2009 and part six of the act has been, was not oper operationalized, you know that word, yeah, that one. Uh, was not operationalized, and in March 2021, the minister, um, in terms of the act uh, uh, um, required for the commencement of Part 6, um, to enable CREN to place certain conditions on the service providers to enable for SIM registration. The essence for it is that Namibia is one of the only two African countries that has still not done that. And it is uh, in relation to international obligations and international commitments that we have made as a country um, to enable, as a country that will require um, SIM registration. I see. Um, though they will just be making introductory remarks for now. We'll get to the, the essence and how, the how part of how that is going to be done. Uh, maybe at this point, may I call on uh, patients to come and talk to us about uh, MTC, how are you preparing to ensure that uh, people are compliant, yourself are compliant, because uh, you need to comply with the regulations that the regulator has set. What are the activities that are happening? But then how, how did you receive it as an operator? Um, good. No, it's on. Good evening. Um, so obviously, as the largest operator in Namibia, we have quite a big customer base. Um, sorry, Telecom, I just had to throw that. <laughs> we have a big customer base um, that we have to register. We country basis initially before basically while we draft while CRAN was busy drafting the regulations to ensure that when the regulations are passed which is only going to be January 2023 correct me if I'm wrong Rusa um, when it becomes operationalized we would have covered we would we would not have to play catch up to catch up with our customers so we've started advertising we are even sending direct SMSs to our subscribers we are present at many different areas just to ensure that we cover at least the 2.3 million customers that we have but the, this is going to cost you as an entity this exercise is going to cost you uh, does it make sense for you it makes sense from a where 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 CRAN is coming from it makes sense it's it's basically to combat crime and what we've realized in our own operations there's been a lot of fraudulent activities with the use of SIM cards. Um, it has become a banking tool, and there's been a lot of complaints coming to us, but we had no control if that SIM card is not registered. Um, so we, we welcome it. It is obviously a very expensive um, exercise. The timeline is short, so obviously we have to do quite a lot, but it, it, I think it's welcome for the protection of our subs for our subscribers. All right. Uh, Perdina? Your views, how have you received this as an entity? 
I know you probably have got something to say about what patients say that being the largest operator in the country, <laughs> but that's probably a discussion for another day. Of course. Um, yes, good evening. Um, I think really for us as telecom, this thing is a law. It's very much a compliance issue for us, so we really just have to... For Big Brother Niger, season seven. Who will bring the heat? What shake-ups will happen within this world? We'll be discussing everything. Don't miss the new season of The Buzz, Tuesdays and Saturdays from 7 p.m. only on Showmax. With never seen before snippets, interviews and reviews hosted by me, Poké Makinwa. Subscribe now at W. That digital identity, what is it? What animal is that? It's, it's literally your identity, similar to what you have now as your national identification card, only in this case it's digital. So when digitally speaking, who you are, your name, the details behind the name, etc. I see. Now, Inspector Albert, some of the reasons that are being advanced for why this must happen is for security reason. Are you really relying on this? Has that informed your investigation to date in any way, form, shape, or size? Uh, well, in terms of the um, Police Act, Section 13 of the Police Act, it mandates the, the police in terms of uh, crime prevention, crime investigation, and so forth. Now, in yesterday's newspaper, we read uh, two conflicting uh, statements, one from our Minister of um, um, defense, Mr. Franz Kapofi, uh, speaking on how he was defrauded by a certain Owen Mahoto. While Mahoto on the other side is saying he's a victim just like uh, Honorable Kapofi. So we, the nation now, as it stands, does not really know as to who took the initiative that culminated into uh, Mr. Kapofi being defrauded of, the, uh, of his money in an amount of 200 um, 200,000. So it's for that purpose that uh, we support this um, initiative, and it's going to be very uh, important in a, in a sense that it's going to help us carry out our investigations uh, in a speedy manner. Thank you. All right. Uh, Apollos, and remember the question really we are asking, we're not really asking whether it's a good thing to do in isolation. We're asking, is it a good thing, and how much of it does it take away from our right to privacy? What, what are your views? Okay, um, good evening everyone. Um, thanks for the question, Steve. Um, uh, before I, I get into this, um, just to state that when I was doing my final year LLB, my dissertation topic was actually, uh, is, the, is part six of the Communications Act a violation to the right to privacy. So, um, as far as uh, this topic is concerned, um, I think one cannot have this discussion without um, having regards to Article 13 of the Constitution, which uh, deals with privacy. And uh, that same article makes provision for instances where um, this right can actually be uh, sort of uh, infringed upon. And um, one of them is um, national security, public safety, uh, as well as the prevention of uh, disorder or crime. So uh, the, the test really is to, to check whether or not uh, the applicable sections in the Act uh, are, being, uh, are seeking to achieve any of the listed um, items in terms of Article 13, as well as to measure it against uh, Article 22, which uh, deals with the limitation of, of rights. And um, I think my conclusion in my thesis was that, um, you know, the sections uh, are lawful. It's, 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 a, it's an infringement, but it's within the, the confines of the law. Uh, the only concern that was there, uh, or maybe before I go to the concern, um, I think when people are uh, discussing this issue, nobody discusses how uh, the interception is done, and also the fact that if you violate uh, this interception uh, provisions, uh, the penalty is actually 100,000, a fine of 100,000, or imprisonment of 10 years. In other words, if you are a staff member that is tasked with uh, this interception, and obviously the interception comes after the SIM registration, uh, there are actually heavy penalties. 
So the only concern uh, that I had uh, discovered then was to say that uh, the only difficulty is uh, who watches uh, the watches. You know, in other words, there are no provisions as to, I, th I think in my view it would be difficult to actually uh, establish that someone has uh, violated these provisions. All right, thank you. Uh, me, Mr. Lengs, are you online? Is there an indication whether Mr. Federico Lengs is connected and he can hear us? Can he hear us? Okay. Uh, please, let's have your initial views uh, on this as we are trying to balance what is necessary and what the, the, the rights that are afforded to citizens are concerned. Uh, let's have your views on that. Um, I got a call from one of our radio stations um, who, you know, who, who, because some of the listeners had called in and complained about the amount or, or you know, the, the sort of the, the, the scope of the information they were have needed to provide to register their SIM card. Um, so, I mean, it, it's clear that um, that you know, people are uncomfortable with, uh, with, with, you know, this, this sort of thing. People realize, I think, um, that there is something um, transpiring um, around their privacy um, and their communications privacy specifically. You know, I've had a number of um, messages of the sort, especially communicated to me via WhatsApp by people over the last few weeks. Uh, communicating discomfort. And people are concerned about privacy. Um, people are concerned about their privacy. And if you look at Afrobarometer, um, the, the eighth round of Afrobarometer, um, where, you know, people were asked, um, let me just quickly deal with that. Um, in the eighth round of Afrobarometer, there was a question specifically to this issue um, around the issue of of um, how comfortable are people with, with um, you know, the sort of communications um, uh, surveillance. And, you know, what, what will be in place as from, from the start of next year. Um, so people were asked uh, a two-part question in, in, in the round, in round eight of Afrobarometer. Um, firstly, government should be able to monitor private communications for example, on mobile phones, to make sure that people are not plotting violence. And 38% of people agreed with that, um, or strongly agreed with that. However, 60% of people agreed with the statement, people should have the right to communicate in private without a government agency reading or listening to what they are saying. So, I mean, 60% of, 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 of the respondents, um, so let's say 60% of Namibians, um, feel strongly about, the, the, about communications privacy. Um, and, and people realize that something is busy happening and that they are not comfortable. With it. Um, and I, I think they, they're not getting, um, uh, they, they are not being adequately assured um, that that their privacy will be protected, um, and we have to state off, uh, you know, right at the start here that um, aside from Article 13 in the Constitution, we don't have uh, any privacy protections, uh, a, a data and online privacy protection bill um, or, or law in Namibia. So you know, all of this is happening in this in this uh, legal vacuum. Um, in terms of privacy, uh, uh, adequate privacy protection and online data protections, um, that we're seeing this this, this mechanism with this uh, with with two facets. This uh, one is the SIM card registration, the other is, of course, the data retention, um, um, mandatory data retention. Um, that that you know is is this uh, wide ranging surveillance enabling mechanism that is being brought into force under 
under the Communications Act, uh, um, Part Six of the Communications Act. Um, and the, the 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 issue, of course, is aside from the the issue of a violation of of of, of privacy, a wide scale violation of privacy. Um, the the issues are, of course, around things like adequate um, oversight, uh, uh, adequate accountability and transparency mechanisms. These these are the things that that we look at, and, and we can, and we say, look, um, I think we would all be assured if we if we actually um, trusted that there were adequate uh, oversight. And, and adequate accountability and adequate and appropriate transparency mechanisms in place. And, and there isn't. Um, aside from um, uh, uh, intelligence and law enforcement having to go before a judge um, and, and, and getting a, 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 a warrant to, to access somebody's communications data, um, there, there, there are no other uh, uh, sort of for due process safeguards and no other oversight or appropriate oversight mechanisms um, in any of our laws that would give us the, the assurances that, you know, um, uh, that there are safeguards in, in, in these systems that would uh, uh, mitigate abuse, surveillance abuse, would mitigate against surveillance overreach um, uh, with, through the, the use of these systems. And we have to understand the context with which we are, with, in which this is operate, this is happening, and, and 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 this is part of, you know, sort of the the concern here, is you know our 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 telecommunications landscape is dominated by state-owned entities which are not um, uh, tr historically transparent uh, uh, organizations um, and and publicly accountable organizations, um, and. The, the private, uh, uh, say, internet service provider, the are they, um, are also sort of within a politically aligned, um, close to the ruling party, uh, um, or individuals within the ruling party. So we're operating in a, in a uh, all of this is happening in a landscape where there is, uh, um, aside from the the, the the privacy concerns, the oversight and accountability and transparency mechanisms, there are other factors on this landscape that are, have to give us pause in terms of um, uh, should we, should we, viewing this in, in, uh, as it's been presented, um, uh, should we be assured? And, and we certainly should, should not be. So, so, I mean, in short, that's, that's sort of the position that from which uh, we're approaching this um, within civil society, within um, you know the, the the threats to privacy, and and the related threats to um, to to freedom of expression of this. All right, M Mr. Lengs, uh, thank you so much uh, for that uh, rather compelling submission. Uh, pl please uh, stay connected, um, Karen. I, I left you deliberately for last, and what I want to get from you is a sense of. Uh, and, and maybe you might not have been mandated to speak for the firm. Uh, but what's the firm's view? What are the things that came through when you were discussing this? What is, what is your feeling with regards to the topic at hand? Um, good evening, everyone. Um, when, the, when this topic arises, there's a lot of discourse and debate around it. Um, so when a million people hear about some registration or surveillance or data storage, they all debate about it and there's a lot of discourse. So um, what happens when this topic arises is that most people's human rights, their fundamental human rights, come to speak. And it is our right to privacy um, as well as our right to freedom of speech. Um, as because most of our most of us use our phones, so freedom of speech comes in hand. Um, but we are we consider it on a neutral basis. We haven't chosen a side, but we um, investigated the law, we compared all the laws, so we looked at the downfalls and on the upsides. So we compared um, 
a lot of regulations as well that um, regulates our human rights as well um, compared to this re some registration and so yeah that's basically what we stand on all right Rusa, please now talk to us uh, at length if you if you like talk to us about how this is going to be done what are you what is it that what kind of information are you getting from us you probably talk to us about why you need it but in part that has been addressed but you can even repeat that what kind of information would you getting from me and what are you going to do with it um, okay so the role of CREN basically is the, to regulate the landscape under which the service providers find themselves. And as such, they need to keep up with the uh, technological trends and developments that are coming up. And as with the um, adoption of telecommunication in, in the past, normal tele, um, telephones, we, the police or the investigation officials realized there was a little bit of a difference with how they did investigation and they needed to catch up. And it's basically the same or the main issues around um, um, part six of the bill is to enable that investigation. The world is changing and is leading towards an uh, industrial revolution that is based on a digital footprint. Everything that we have is moving into that direction. I basically don't have to go to the bank because everything is on my phone. So meaning my whole earning for that month is on my phone, is on my number. If I am going to do e-commerce or business and I don't have a banking account, a business banking account, because I cannot afford perhaps the paperwork around it, I need my phone because my customers are either paying to sell or paying to my number, right? Uh, and our elders are receiving some of their pension or, or their uh, income from their kids on the phone. The phone is becoming part of us and as a result is leading to a lot of criminal activities that are hampering the safe lives of our people. So it is not only an issue of privacy, but we need to balance the rights that are associated with everybody. Now, Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that everybody has a right to live freely and safely in a given uh, state. So I know that we understand the issues around privacy and dignity as the two rights. However, every court or every country has to keep in mind that state obligations don't apply to only one right or two rights. There has to be a play of balancing proportionately all the rights. No, the, no right is absolute or higher than another right. They are not indivisible. There is no hierarchy of which one surpasses which right? So m your right to safety may end where my right, uh, your right to privacy may end where my right to safety is concerned, and that is the essence with behind it. As to the information that we, but that the service providers will be uh, collecting from you is just your identification um, documents that are required to prove that the number really belongs to you. Because if you just come and say, I'm, 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 I'm registering this number is mine, but it ends up that it's Rusa's number, and Rusa's whole life is linked to that number, how will the service providers indemnify themselves and protect themselves that, well, he presented or she presented evidence that the number belongs to him, and it's through the evidence of the ID or documentation, identification documentation that you provide, and the um, residential or whichever uh, proof that your service provider will require from you in terms of the Regulation 5. Now, when the service provider collects this information from us and gives it to you as CREN, what, where do you deposit this and what do you do with it? The, the information is not stored by CREN. Uh, CREN does not have the capacity to store that information. And I think this question is better suited, perhaps, answered by the service providers as to perhaps how they will address that. However, yeah, so we don't really have the capacity. But how would you know that they have complied? Because obviously this is a state requirement and there are compliance requirements. Every institution has a compliance division that you need to comply with the regulations in place. And, and if, if, if there is an aggrieved party that they feel that 
by the service provider uh, complying with this is violating their right. Article 25 of the Constitution enabled them to approach a competent court, and Crane has always abided by the decision of the court as it's trust in the independence of the court. And we employ the people perhaps to do that rather. All right. Uh, Berina, please come in uh, and tell us, after you've collected this information, what are you going to do before you, you show your compliance with the regulator? So, yeah, I guess it's the assurance that uh, uh, Frederico was speaking to. So once the information is obtained from the customers, we are required to store it for a period of five years. And the storage really is with the operators, like um, Rosa have indicated. And we, we literally just store it. And unless it's required by the security agencies, we store it for five years, and then that's it. There was a comment made earlier by Frederico, which I would want to get your, your views on, that that space is dominated by public enterprises. And they are not apparently not known for being the most accountable. How is the accountability going to be different this time around? Well, I, I, I cannot speak as to where Frederico is coming with um, that statement. But what I can perhaps speak to is the fact that um, the access to this information that is being obtained from the customers, you would note that in terms of the existing legal framework that is your the existing legal framework that enables anyone to have access to this information, that is your, your Criminal Procedure Act, your Anti-Corruption Act, your, your NCCIS Act, all of those requires at least a warrant for anyone to access that information. So accountability, I'm not too sure, but at least what we have in place as a legal framework, at least to some extent, gives um, an element of comfortability in that the information will not be accessed without proper uh, permission or a warrant in place. All right. Uh, patients, please come in there. Assurances. Uh, we're talking about assurances here. We, we, we're worried. When we give you this information, how do we guarantee the safety thereof, even within your own staff? Okay. So if I may, I first want to I'll come to your question. <laughs> Address what I think is a misunderstanding or a misconception. We are not storing any of your communication in terms of the proposed regulations or conditions. We will not be listening to your conversations. In fact, we don't even have the technical ability to do that. We will not be storing your SMSs. The regulations and the conditions that are now placed as license conditions to operators doesn't even require us to give that information to anyone. The only information we are giving is party A spoke to party B, and party A worked from this tower, and I am in this tower. That's it. There is no SMSs, there's no communications. Your rights to privacy are not being infringed on from a perspective of your communication. Um, with this information and what these conditions that are now placed, there's nothing different from what the Criminal Procedure Act already requires. This is a search warrant. We, we, this is given to us on a daily basis. We process a lot of search warrants. It is just party A spoke to party B. The only difference with the SIM registration is that party A has a name and party B has a name, and we know where you live because we need your um, proof of residence as part of registration. Your proof of residence is all over the place in any case. It's with the banks. You needed to apply for a bank account. It's nothing new in the environment. Now, to the question of accountability, because it's not something new we are doing, we process search warrants on a daily basis. Um, we are accountable
I believe I have answered your question. All right. Uh, Mr. Lengs, we have really uh, canvassed the, the assurance. In your view, what would be acceptable assurances that you find absent at the moment? Yeah, um, you know, so, so there was a lot said there, and, and I think we have to um, back against some of those, uh, some of those assertions. Um, if, if, if these compliance, if, if these systems are being uh, properly used, um, and, and I mean, I hear a number of people saying that these things are, are there, um, they are uh, using criminal procedures. We're back at Biggie's! For Big Brother Niger Season 7. Who will bring the heat? What shakeups will happen within this world? We'll be discussing everything. Don't miss the new season of The Buzz, Tuesdays and Saturdays from 7 p.m. only on Showmax. With never seen before snippets, interviews, and reviews hosted by me, Poke Makinwa. Subscribe now at www.showmax.com. We're back at of of proportionality, and you know, if you look at uh, court cases in in around the world where the issue of um, is is data retention, the sort of mass surveillance type data retention, is it is it uh, uh, um, constitutional uh, under various uh, uh, constitutional jurisdictions? And, and the question, the, the answer ha, has been has been uh, no in, in a lot of them. Um, in the EU, they're continuously having um, cases. And earlier this year, they had another one where the European Court uh, of Justice declared a, a data retention scheme such as the ones that we are going to implement next year unconstitutional, um, where they, the court actually declared it. Declared it uh, incompatible with uh, privacy protection in the European Union um, under European law. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 uh, to just say that, that uh, we're, we're complying with the law, um, you know, is, is, is certainly not enough. And, and to the, you know, you can use the law to do things which, which, are, uh, which violate people's rights and, and, and using the excuse of um, you know, we're complying with the law. And, and, and you know, uh, to just say that we, you know, we, we are in compliance with the law isn't enough. Um, we're supposed to take uh, the police's and the intelligence service and the CRAN's word for it. That, no, we're not. Where are the reports that show that um, there is compliance? Where are the transparency reports? In, in systems like these, um, in, in other places, there are transparency reports. Reports that show so many warrants were issued under this, uh, uh, so many surveillance warrants were issued, inter communications interception warrants were issued by this court uh, or that court and this magistrate. And, and um, this, is, this is what they were issued for without having to name a uh, suspect or anything. Um, and, and this is what, if, you know, just to use the, the, uh, the uh, in, in terms of what we would like to see, um, the, 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 uh, in, in 2019, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights um, uh, amended the, its uh, Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa. And Principle 40, 40 and 41 in, in, in the Declaration um, speak to this issue. And I mean, I, I'm going to, I just want to read this, um, and, and Principle 41 especially. Uh, um, deal specifically with privacy and communication surveillance. Um, and number one, states shall not engage in or condone acts of indiscriminate and untargeted collection, storage, analysis, or sharing of a person's communications. Number two, states shall only engage in targeted communication surveillance that is authorized by law, that conforms with international human rights law and standards, and that is premised on specific and reasonable suspicion that a serious crime has been or is being carried out for any or any other legitimate aim. Now, in terms of the safeguards, the assurances that I'm talking about, um, I'll, I'll point to, to, to point three under principle 41. 
State shall ensure that any law authorizing targeted communication surveillance provides adequate safeguards for the right to privacy, including a, a the prior authorization of an independent and impartial judicial authority, b due process safeguards, c specific limitation on the time, manner, place, and scope of the surveillance, d notification of the decision authorizing surveillance within a reasonable time of the conclusion of such surveillance, e proactive transparency on the nature and scope of its use, and f effective monitoring and regular review by an independent oversight mechanism. Now, you know, especially in terms of D, E, and F, um, this is where our concern, where we, where we would have hoped that uh, uh, Namibia would have, you know, uh, 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 tried to be in compliance or, or followed the guidance from the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Um, but that's the sort of best practice uh, guidance that they, they that they provide with the with the with the declaration on uh, on, on notification, on, right. on right. transparency, and on on effective monitoring and oversight, okay. and and these none of this is is in our in our uh, um, in 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 our law, any of our laws by the way, uh, that that deal with surveillance or in in in, in these regulations. Um, um, may, may I and, may and, and I this is, you know, this so, so there, there are, there's best practice guides out there, and, and we don't meet that best practice guidance. That, that's the situation. Thank you. C can you hear me now? It seems that at one point uh, we were just hearing you, but you were not hearing us. But, but thank you once again for, for really responding to that. I think you have adequately covered the, the question that I had put to you, and I have particular interest the points that you have listed, especially F. Uh, Inspector Albert, please prepare a response for F, which speaks to the independent monitoring as to the application of this. Where, where is that within your system? When, when you obtain uh, these warrants and uh, they, it's based on a legal instrument, the, the execution thereof, how is the monitoring there that is actually executed within the space provided for. Of course, the warrant will detail what is it that must be obtained, that that is what is really being obtained. How, how do we get comfort in that? Uh, look, um, as Tinta has indicated earlier, that uh, any person out there that feels like his or her rights have been uh, uh, violated has the right to approach a competent court and um, prove to the court that indeed their constitutional rights have been uh, violated. Now, so far, we have not gotten anyone that uh, laid a complaint about the Namibian police not keeping um, this um, information that, that they got from the service provider through a search warrant. Uh, now, coming to your, uh, your question is that um, what we need to understand is that uh, the police only request uh, a se or use a search warrant to request for data from the service provider when a certain or particular number is of uh, interest, when your number has not been involved in a commission of a crime, we would definitely not be interested in, 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 uh, in getting the, the records thereof. Uh, now, what we need to understand is that we only for every uh, data that we receive from the service provider, we only use it for that intended purposes as uh, indicated in the, in, the, in, the what? in the search warrant. For any other personal papers that I cannot uh, speak for, but we stick to that. Yeah, and, and the question is exactly that. Mm -hmm. you, you are giving us that assurance. Who can confirm that assurance that you're giving us? If, if we don't have it in place, we can concede and then we we'll move on. We find other spaces to, to attack on. All right, maybe we... Okay. Uh, Apollos, you, you earlier on spoke to who's watching the watcher. And, and this is the point that uh, Frederico is now raising. In your investigation, what, what did you find are the, the remedies, the avenues that are available that could give us comfort and us thinking that, or believing that, 
there is a reasonable amount of comfort that this thing will be executed as provided for by the law. Okay, um, so I think to answer your question, um, I think um, as far as this topic is concerned, the focus is on, on the Communications Act and the regulations. Mm. But obviously other laws um, also then come into the picture. Um, you know, um, I think as far as, uh, for example, um, the warrants that, um, you know, my colleague just referred to, um, the thing is, uh, these warrants, um, a typical example is um, um, if someone is arrested and they are charged with a criminal offense, uh, this warrant will have to be disclosed to this person and um, uh, that person or the legal representative will have to have a look at it. Uh, as well as cross-examine whoever you know issued this warrant, and uh, as a matter of fact, we have had a number of warrants that have been you know declared unlawful in the manner in which they were obtained. Um, I think um, the case of reference is the, the case of uh, of um, I think Teco. The number of warrants were were set aside in in the in the manner in which. They were obtained. They might have been warrants of uh, a different nature, but you know, it speaks to the same thing. It, the, the, every warrant must be obtained in compliance with the law. Now, coming back to the Communications Act, um, it's 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 a difficult issue, I think, um, because um, in my view, uh, or what I had proposed was uh, perhaps um, some kind of. of um, auditing entity that has some, some uh, kind of audit rights over a certain period of time to say that what have you guys been doing, how was it done, just to, not necessarily to get into what was being done, but just to make sure that everything is being done, um, you know, procedurally. All right. Uh, let's not forget that we're streaming this event live, so we also have following on the social media platform. Should there be questions, you can just pose them and we'll be able to put it to the, to the, to the panelists. Even here in the audience, I'm sure by now we have uh, questions. Uh, I think it's only appropriate that we allow those that want to have a go at this panel. It's not every day that you get a, a panel this rich at your disposal. So by, there is a hand at the back. If there is a roving mic that we can get there, um, that, that will be good. So what you do is that you just introduce yourself and then you pose a question, a very brief one. If you want to make a comment, you do so. But we will not allow you to make further statements competing with them, no. Uh, just make uh, very brief uh, observations. Th there was a hand at the back. Uh, oh, there's another one here, okay. Yeah, my name is uh, Max Amata. I'm a journalist with a Confidente newspaper. Um, my question is uh, particularly to, uh, I would like to, 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 to ask, uh, or to pose a question rather, as to how, especially from the regulatory point of view, how does this legal provision compare to international regimes and uh, instruments uh, such as the Budapest Convention? Is it in compliance or are there competing interests? Because um, uh, Namibia is not unique in introducing uh, SIM registration. S so it, it will just be, be, be informing, it will be well informing if we can get a perspective on how it compares to other international uh, legal instruments. Uh, such as the Buda Budapest Convention. Uh, thank you very much. I was talking about how rich the, the panel is. Uh, the audience is equally rich. I can see a few individuals that I can identify. If they do not introduce themselves at the end of the discussion, I'll introduce them. Uh, can we get another one, another input, maybe two more, and then we deal with them at one go. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Jesaya. Uh, my first question is um, to the service providers. Um, they said um, one of the, let me say, requirements is an ID for one to be registered. Uh, we know quite in Namibia we have quite a lot of people that don't have 
IDs or they are not in possession of uh, these documents, how do you plan on um, helping them or including them or will they not be able to access SIM cards since they don't have IDs? And those ones that are already in possession of SIM cards and they don't have IDs, um, how are you going to go about including them also? Uh, another question is um, also on um, or the information that you said are going to be kept uh, service providers who have access to that information and how um, are you going to regulate uh, access to such information within your company as a service provider and how sure are you uh, that such a person will not use that information for personal interest? All right. Uh, those two points are taken. Uh, I'm taking two more, and then I'll allow them to answer, and then we'll go, come for another round. Good evening. My name is Ivy. From uh, I'm a student from uh, from UNAM, doing my my third year law. I'd like to find out from Miss Tana. She mentioned that uh, the information will be stored for five years. So. Out of interest, would like to know uh, what happened there after after five years with the information. What do you do with the information after five years? All right, thank you. Can we take a last one for this round? Um, Is it on? Yeah, okay. my question relates to the admissibility of such uh, evidence. Can, in can we know who's talking to us? Tileni. Tileni. Yeah, okay. the admissibility of such evidence into the court. Because when you talk about this digital stuff and forced industrial revolution, it's subject to fraudulent stuff. And it's as easy as me taking her phone and texting and, um, you know, committing my crime. So. How admissible is it really? Because if I'm a lawyer and my accused is, and the state is trying to bring such evidence into court, I'm going to fight tooth and nails before such evidence is accepted because it's unreliable in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tileni. Um, so we have it. Uh, Rusa, Max wants to know, is this uh, provision aligning with the Budapest Convention and other conventions. Uh, Albertina, you can already prepare Yesaya's response with regards to people who do not have IDs and the possible abuse thereof, as well as uh, after five years, what happens? Ailey wants to know that. And of course, uh, Inspector, and probably uh, patients can also assist if she so wishes. The, the admissibility of this evidence, uh, given the, the possibility and the easiness within which people, multiple people could use the same device. Uh, how are you going to navigate around that? Uh, Rusa, you can start. Um, um, if, let me just get clarity. The Budapest Convention is the one on cybercrime, right? Okay. So the cybercrime issues don't fall under the cybercrime bill that is currently before parliament. And I think I am not suited currently to speak on that since there's a bill in the works on with respect to that. As to whether the Communication Act is in compliance as to part six with the other parts or with other convention, I would say that they are in compliance with certain aspects of the international uh, 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 telecommunication um, unions that uh, CREN is part of or CRASA is part, uh, CREN is part to CRASA and ITU. So there are international obligations that as a state we have to abide to. So in other convention, I would say a human rights convention, like I say, where if I borrow from Mr. Ling's arguments, because he referred to a decision that was decided by the, what you call it, the European uh, court, the European court in, in, in a number of cases has tend to hold states accountable for failure to uphold their positive obligation of ensuring the protection of, 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 of lives and rights where security measures or support measures could have been adopted and employed in a manner to oversee and ensure the protection of a variety of rights and state has failed. So 
we are in compliance with human rights institutions, especially the Universal Declaration, and we will like to believe so, I guess. All right, uh, Albertina, IDs, not so many of them have been issued to everybody. So if a customer does not have an ID, you would note that um, Regulation 7, um, I think 7, 7, 5, Regulation 7, 5D um, gives other alternatives that the customer can provide in the absence of an ID, and that's any other identification document with a picture of, of the customer. Your passport, for instance, um, your driver's license, all of that can be used as an alternative to an ID. Then, with regard to the question of the storage of the information for a period of five years, so after the period of five years have lapsed, the obligation or the compliance obligation on the operator is no longer there, falls away, and we can therefore really um, uh, get rid of that uh, record. You're going to shred it? It, this is digital uh, records. Digitally now. <laughs> and the abuse, there was an issue around the abuse, the possible abuse that could be linked to this, even of your own staff. I think that's the point that uh, Josiah raised. Um, I think one of the safeguards currently that is put in place from, uh, uh, from the le uh, legal framework is speaking specifically to the SIM card um, regulations that's being introduced is that you would note that the regulation requires the operators to designate two persons from um, each entity who would then be dealing with this information and liaising with the security agencies. All right, uh, Inspector Abbott, uh, talk to us about the admissibility of this. Uh, what has the experience been? Because you have already been doing these things. Uh, have you had a, a good success rate around evidence obtained in this manner being admissible? No, of course. Um, you know, what we need to understand is police officers are human beings just like any other human being. In as much as a magistrate or a judge can make a mistake, the police officer can also make a mistake. There have been, of course, incidences where um, some evidence uh, presented before court by the police or by the eye or investigating officer were challenged and, of course, were thrown out of court, as uh, Mr. Apollos has indicated. But you know, police operates, does not operate in vacuum. It operates within the confinement of the law, being it the law of evidence or any other laws that is relevant to the um, case at hand. Now, what we need to understand is that when evidence is, uh, is uh, adduced before court, in an event where it's established that the police did not comply or did not act within the conformity of the law in as much as the attaining of such evidence is concerned. And then we leave it in the hands of the court to pronounce itself where the police now erred and the, the court will pronounce itself in that regard to decide if whether to admit such evidence or not to admit it. So the issue of admissibility is not really from the police. For us is to investigate and um, adduce evidence before court. The court then makes a final decision in admissibility of the evidence provided. Thank you. They, they say ask a lawyer about anything they would venture or tender an opinion. Patience, what are your views around the admissibility, the likely admissibility of evidence obtained in this manner? Um, so, so again, it's ownership, right? You, you've bought a SIM card, it's registered in your name, so it's your SIM card. Uh, the assumption would be you have used it um, for whatever the court needs to prove. It's the same as you get in a car accident. Um, they could not see who's driving the car. They will first come to you, and you will need to prove that you are not driving your car at that moment. Um, so obviously, with all evidence, you need corroboratory evidence as well to back it up. All right. On the platform, there seems to be a great support, overwhelming support for the registration of SIM cards. Uh, people do not see a problem with it. Uh, but then there are other issues. For instance, uh, one from... Uh, Gregory Francisco says, one can get uh, relief from the court, but the courts are very expensive. So how, what other avenues could be availed to those that feel aggrieved? Uh, Crane uh, regulator, you can come in here. Uh, then there is another one from Blessed Kambanda who says, 
How about if a number is registered under a company's name or a corporate or SME, then who do you hold uh, liable for whatever is uh, done through the use of the, the, that number? Uh, do you want to take them now or should I add more from the audience? You, you, may, you may proceed. The second question is, what if the, and that will probably go to, you can share that between the, the police and yourself. If the number is registered in the name of a company, who are you going to hold liable then for whatever would have been committed through the use of that number? Okay, I think the second question will go to the police. Um, with respect to the first question about the relief um, aspect and that the courts are very expensive, this is an aspect that I think the nation and the government at large have understood that is very expensive. And um, the Ministry of Justice have recently been doing um, um, stakeholders consultation on pro bono uh, work and also to, to, to see if they can find measures in place to enable pro bono uh, provision for legal practitioners or legal representation. Another I will look, I will see is the Legal Aid Act um, of, or the Legal Aid Act enable persons that cannot afford um, legal representation to make application for possible consideration. However, I think the shortfall of the Legal Aid Act is that it has a monetary value that you need to pay a certain amount before you can uh, con be considered also or that you have to fall within a, diff a specific threshold of, of, of the population. I think another aspect would be that part Article 25 of the Constitution enable you to um, seek remedy from institutions such as the Ombudsman uh, and also um, some entities such as LAC often like to assist and take up such constitutional issues. So the issue of course, especially in the new current financial sphere that the world finds itself in, we wholly understand that. And perhaps uh, working closely with both the civil society and others, perhaps those are areas of uh, investigations and collaborations that um, all stakeholders involved, be it the population and the government at large, need to investigate. The, the issue around the being registered in the company name, uh, liability, who, who are you going to follow? Is it the company and its staff members, or how are you going to navigate through that? That's the police. Yes, that's the police, yes. When you are investigating and you want to obtain your warrant and you want to discover what's happening on that number, so where does the liability then lie? No, um, you see, a company is a, a legal entity. Um, in that uh, instance, then, of course, there should be someone that has used that. Uh, through our investigations, we'll be able to establish, um, and that's why we are saying we need numbers registered. So we we'll know that this uh, particular number belongs to ABCN uh, company. So through our investigations, we'll then be able to establish um, and um, hold the party accountable. All right, let, let's take another round of questions from the, just when I thought they were going to be less. Uh, le, let's see, take all of them to the extent that we can. Uh, and uh, let's record them so that when we respond, we, we do so in the quickest possible manner. But let's have one question per person or one comment so that we accommodate everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm Frida Akunda. I'm a member of the public. Um, my question is directed to, I think, Inspector Abbott. Uh, Inspector Frida wants your attention. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Inspector, um, we, we, we know it's common, it's not a secret that we have certain rogue police officers, right, who are able to pull off favors on behalf of people that they know without necessarily following the procedures within the institution. So my question to you is, what, what, what systems or um, how is the police going to guard against this, this rogue police officers pulling off a favor on behalf of someone, getting a, a search warrant from a magistrate, and then approaching the service provider to get information on someone? What are the systems that NAMPO has in place? Great, um, let's take one more, a few more. 
before we respond? I, uh, is that a joint question? Or? No, no, no. We are, oh, okay. we are not together. Please, have yours. <laughs> um, good evening. My name is Vincent Shimtukeni. I think my question is just it's directed to Kren. I, I think I didn't really grasp when it was coming to the, the regulation. I just want to ask, um, come January 2023, the registration of some cards is mandatory. Come April or December 2023, um, yes, the different telecommunication uh, bodies have their own compliance within their structures. But what mechanisms does CREN as the regulatory body or authority have in place to monitor and to see whether you know, MTC or telecom have actually been um, what, what mechanisms does a CREN have in place uh, once this uh, mandatory registration has? And then finally, I think I'm one of those people that have already accepted. I think I would want to ask my provider, MTC, uh, in, the, 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 in terms of the actual registration, what is required of me as a person when I walk out of here? Because I'm of the assumption that my SIM card, uh, MTC already knows it's my SIM card because I've lost it before I've renewed it. They've already asked my details. Is that sufficient or do I still need to go to, to MTC physically to provide something else? Thank you. All right. Uh, noted. Uh, and? She asked, but she asked before. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he's got the powers now. You can't argue with him, can you? Now? Yes. Thank you very much, Tamba. Um, I'm Loide Shaparara, and I... I I have a few responses, if I may. Um, I think the, the, the question around the cost, the, the legal cost, I think the, the reason when the policy decision was made to place or to take the route that has been taken in the regulations, the, one of the considerations was the cost. And if we if we study the communications act carefully, we would notice that the reason why this is done through the methodology suggested that the obligation is placed on the service provider is because within the communications act, CRAN, there is existing mechanisms for CRAN to hold the service providers accountable as well as to enable the subscribers to engage in registered disputes and complaints that they might have with the service providers. So CRAN as the regulator already have those powers. With regard to the liability issues on the companies, um, I think it was mentioned that the regulation requires that certain people within your institution is identified. And those people will be the people that are responsible for compliance, but that will also be held answerable with regard to um, any violations that happen within the company. The, and the admissibility issue, it is rightly because any evidence that is adduced in court needs to be authenticated. And if you do not have a subscriber or somebody ident that is identified as the, the owner of this number, we might never be able to admit any kind of evidence electronically because we do not have anybody that can either authenticate or avert any decision that is made in, in a particular document. So I think that is really the, the considerations, the policy considerations that underline the regulation. And I also have um, in a sense, some unease with the height uh, or the, the unjustified tension that civil society attempts to create around this issue. I don't know how they imagine that as N the Namibian state can go and make a commitment uh, to observe these declarations that was mentioned by Mr. Lynx and come back and not honor them. I, I don't understand that kind of logic. Thank you. Thank you very much, I told you the audience was equally rich as the panelists. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can we have a few? Oh. <laughs> Mr. Congo, you have just uh, been offered an opportunity to be heard. Oh, OK. Uh, good evening, all. My name is Charles Mbeha, uh, Office of the Attorney General. Uh, I would just like to, mine is a comment, not a question. 
I think it's a good provision. Uh, I think sometimes uh, as citizens we over criticize. Uh, we, we need to understand that at times government must be given certain uh, functions or powers in order to be able to protect the inhabitants. I mean, it's all fun to criticize this provision until your child is kidnapped and they cannot trace because the person used the phone. Then you go to the police, you say how useless they are. But now when they come up with something like this, to try to be able to do something. I do understand the issue of privacy, but again, you have to balance it. To say, do we protect criminals? We don't register the SIM, or we must register the SIM so we know who's using this phone and so forth. And what I heard from the panel, uh, I don't think they will really be listening to people's conversations, but it's really just to have an identity to say, this belongs to this, that belongs to that one. And it's common, if you go in a shop to buy furniture, hire pages, they require your identity, so they have it. Universities, wherever. So most, even your phones, they have your identity. But I think we distrust our government so much. I'm not sure why, but <laughs> I think it's a good provision. Thank you. Okay. Uh, th thank you so much, Charles. Maybe you and Lloyd should have not spoken one after the other, but we take your input. I'll give it straight to you. Good evening, all. Um, I'm Marius Filyun, part of Karen's firm. And um, before this, I was a programmer in Johannesburg for a few years, so my concern is coming from the technological background that I have. But a, a thing that I want the panelists to consider before going forward is the fact that now we've got, we're going to have a central database with all of this information stored. So there is the, the chance, the danger of, instead of protecting citizens, suddenly they're exposed to criminals. Because the very first thing that we should remember, a criminal is a criminal. You can make Whatever laws you want, they're disobeying the laws. That is what makes them the criminal in the first place. <laughs> so now we're making cyber crime laws. We're imposing penalties of 100,000 and um, prison terms and all of this. But they're anyways ignoring the laws. And now we've given them this register with all of the information that can help them with identity theft going forward. They can get our cell phone numbers, which we've seen from the panelists have become very important in our own personal identity and in control of our currency. They can get the information from there, from the banks, they can get our bank information. And together with that, identity theft can easily exist through these two central points of registration. So it's just something I would like people to consider and how we go forward with protecting this information, not just with laws, but physical security and software or cyber security included. Thank, thank you, Marco. Thank you, thank you very much, Marius. Uh, much appreciated. I think you, you're really making a very uh, compelling submission as well. But we're not going to say where we are going to store it, eh? but <laughs> it must be stored somewhere safe. Yes, I okay. saw you negotiating. Uh, giving yeah, it yes, chance. Uh, so, yes, my name is Marco Cadondana, and I'm a final year law student. And mine is maybe an extension of Marius's question. Because my question is really, is it really safe for us to enact part six or to bring into operation part six of the Communications Act without a Data Protection Act. Because we have seen during COVID, um, I think there was a regulation that, that made it mandatory for, for companies or places that have access to the public to keep a, a record where you write your name, your cell name, your cell phone number, and we know how that was subject to abuse. So my question is then, are we really able to, to have that part six in operations without at least having these um, Data Protection Act in, in, in place. All right. Uh, let's have Mr. Shade. He's just there behind you. Uh, I'd be indebted to him if I don't allow him to speak. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. Klaus Shade, I'm an economist, not a lawyer. Um, I have two, three points. Uh, first of all, uh, the practicality of, of the registration. According to Telecom, uh, we are required to submit uh, ID and proof of residence and so on and so forth uh, and get a statement from the police. 
It might work in the formal uh, settlements in Windhoek and Oshakati and so, but not in the informal settlements. Uh, you can't prove uh, residents, uh, let alone in the remote rural areas. Secondly, uh, most of our um, citizens who do not have an ID, do not have a birth certificate even. Um, how will they prove who they are? They don't have a photo, of course. Uh, they don't have a passport. They, have a, uh, they don't have a, a, a driver's license. And then the police has to uh, issue statements for each and everyone who wants to register a car, maybe for 2.5 million, or I think we have even more SIM card holders in, in Namibia. Is that possible within the next four months? Um, secondly, on what has been raised already, as uh, the supervision. Um, I think there is a need. We do have a media ombuds uh, person, uh, ombuds person, that there is a kind of data protection ombuds person who has access uh, to these storages and can follow the paper or the digital trail. I think that would uh, provide uh, citizens with assurance that it's uh, at least to, to a certain degree properly handled. And is there at all, uh, I'm not a technician also, is there at all a possibility for a digital trail to really follow uh, whether certain data has been released and whether there is a search warrant um, and so on? Thank you. All right, we have almost exhausted the time that has been allocated to us for this. Let me allow for three more inputs Condition, however, is that whoever takes the mic now only has one issue to make. If it's a comment, it's a comment. If it's a question, it's a question. Uh, can we have those three? Uh, John Congo is one uh, for being a gentleman and passing it on. And then we'll take two more others. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, my name is John Congo, And I'll, I'll indemnify myself. I'm not a lawyer, but I do have a biased opinion because I'm a former journalist and currently employed by MTC, so you know where I'm leaning already. <laughs> As a journalist in the Communications Act, when it was introduced, the first draft, around about 2007, I was a reporter, and the only key thing that came out, forgetting anything, is about, oh, the politicians want to spy on us. And then it was called the spy bill. That was all. Government, or the authorities let it be, and 10 years later, we realize we are in this mess. Now your cell phone is no longer a Tamagotchi, it's many other things. My comment is, and I've not heard any of the panelists or members of the public defending the cause of those voiceless who every day approach MTC because some scammer from India has managed to go into his FNB wallet and stole his last savings. Those are daily occurrence with us, and we don't see it for it for what we are. But where then is the intent and protection for those occurrences? And I'm putting this to the members of the panel and members of the public because we have had civil society's consent, but we do not have a recourse to what happens when those happen. And every day, we've got people in our mobile homes complaining that I've lost my salary. And what do we do as an entity and as operators and service providers? Can we stand back and fold our hands until it happens to you? Or should we do something and guide us what it is the right process that we need to do? I think I'll just leave you to that. As I said, I'm biased. And I do work for MTC because they pay my salary. Yeah, no, we, we saw your, your bias. Uh, and we leave it at that. We're not going to pursue further because I was going to say some people say their airtime also disappears without them knowing where it goes to. But we are not going to respond to that. Can we take two last ones? There's a hand there. That will be second last and then... Oh, Josie wants to have the final bite. So there's a hand at the back. The gentleman in red, and then Josie closes it off, and then we respond. And we, that should be it, really, for this evening. 
Um, good evening, my name is Atu. I have um, one question to the regulatory bodies, MTC and um, Telecom. What features or safety security measures do you have against being hacked for this information? Thank you. Great. Let's, let's bring it to the front uh, as we are closing off. Uh, Josie? Yes. He's a uh, journalist, I, I, he's so many things. Yeah, I think I, my, my, my question is on almost the same thing, but just different. Um, and I think the biggest concern that I'm hearing is not necessarily whether SIM registration happens. What the, I think the biggest concern is the competency and the capacity to be able to safeguard that people's data does not end up in the wrong hands. So how do you deal with that issue? And I think it was raised about where is Kren's capacity to handle that? And I think we need to make that clear. What is the capacity and the capability of all the entities, including MTC and Telecom, to be able to safeguard that no one, no rogue police officer can get access to that information and play, pass it on to somebody else. Um, the, I, I, let me rest my case there. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me thank all of you for the inputs. We will now allow the, the panel to respond to this. We'll probably start with Joseph. Uh, it's, it's recurrent and it tells us that maybe the responses we are giving, they are not giving sufficient assurances. Where is all of this going to come together? Whether it's in one room or in separate rooms? And when it does so, what is the security around the utilization of this information? Uh, that's probably the assurance that uh, is being sought. Atu wants to know around the, the hacking capabilities around that. And uh, I think MTC and uh, TN Mobile will speak to that. We are not going to say anything about what John has said. We know why he said what he has said. Uh, Frida to Inspector Abbott, the rogue police officers, how are you going to tame them, ensure that they are kept in check? Uh, Vincent also then uh, had an input, but he really wanted to know what needs to be done. Lloyd and Charles, uh, we took note of what you said. Uh, thank you for enriching the conversation. Marius, given his expertise around uh, programming and the like, the protection around that, and then the few points that uh, Klaus Schroeder then shared with us around the, the, the proof of uh, residence in certain areas, uh, no IDs, the supervision, and then there was a question around as well from uh, without enacting the, the Data Protection Act, is this the right time to really operationalize uh, this part of the act? Uh, Rusa, you have a handful, you can start. Okay. Um, I would like to start with the ensuring compliance by the operators. Um, as indicated, CREN is the regulator for the telecommunication or communication uh, 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 service providers. And in terms of the act, they have a duty to ensure that they comply to the provision of the act. Um, they do, they, we have um, investigators in cases of, of complaints that are levied against the, the operator. We have investigators that will often investigate um, such issues or we also give the the service providers a chance once a complaint have been, have been laid for them to give us their side of the story for us to continue with the investigation and to make um, a decision based on that. And like any other institution, I would like to believe that um, NT, uh, uh, sorry, Telecom and, and, and MTC have a compliance department because we definitely do have. And by such, they need to ensure that all their books and all their uh, work with relation to the regulator are in, um, are in order, and that's uh, how we ensure compliance. Um, the other issue is how do we, in, why are we commencing part six without um, enacting the Data Protection Act? Now, the Communication Act falls under the Ministry of Information and Telecommunication, where the Data Protection Act uh, is, um, Currently, the Data Protection Act, the Cyber um, Security Bill, Cyber Crime Bill, are currently under works. And, and there are some of the priority bills as 
as part of the, of, of the work surrounding the fourth industrial revolution. Um, the commencement of the act is needed to ensure that we, the other, to ensure compliance and to ensure that we have registered the same registration. We are working tirelessly to assist with comments or whatever needs to be uh, uh, requested from us as a stakeholder with regard to the Data Protection Act. However, the ministry responsible for Data Protection Act, I think, will be better suited to, uh, to, uh, to let us know by when that will be enacted. But all I can say is that it, it's in the works, and I know that it's something that has already been to CCL, or which is Cabinet Com Committee on Legislation, and I know that the, the state is working tirelessly to ensure that that bill is passed. All right, Mr. Lengs, as you making your final submissions, uh, there has been a bit of pushback from the audience. Uh, the suggestion that the, the government might really want to do so many bad things against us. Uh, what really give credence to such a suspicion? Why would our own government hate us so much? Uh, and I'm stretching it, I know. Um, uh, could you just uh, repeat that uh, the question? I, I, I lost you halfway through and to the end there. Uh, all right, I was saying, because now we are making our final submissions, as you do that, uh, we have seen from the audience here that there is a, there is a feeling that the, the government would not necessarily be that reckless uh, in the implementation and execution of uh, these provisions. There, there should be reasonable safeguards there. But what is your suspicion based on? Oh, well, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, um, I, I get the sense that, that people aren't aware of the literature on this stuff um, in, in Namibia. I mean, th there's a growing body of, 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 of evidence and, and, and research and, and reports out there on, you know, the, the impacts of, of uh, uh, SIM card registration and data retention schemes on, on this continent and, and uh, countries around the world and how these schemes, these systems have been used and abused by, by governments. Now, uh, um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll just to, to uh, take a statement from one of the organizations that has successfully challenged uh, uh, data retention um, schemes in various countries and, and had them declared unlawful, uh, Privacy International, the global uh, privacy um, uh, rights, uh, digital rights organization. And, and, and they have been on this issue for, for more than a decade. Um, and, and Privacy International states um, that while governments justify mandatory SIM card registration laws on the grounds that they assist in preventing and detecting crime, there is no convincing empirical evidence that mandatory registration, in fact, systemic, systematically lowers crime rates. And no robust empirical studies that show that such measures make a difference in terms of crime detection. Now, um, you know, the, 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 while you know, there aren't any studies that actually prove the effectiveness, and, and I mean, th this is the messaging that has been used by the regulator um, talking about national security and crime prevention. But, I mean, there's actually globally evidence. These, these systems have been around for um, more than two decades. And there's, glo there's, there's a growing body of evidence around whether these, and, and experience around whether these systems actually work for what the stated, state, stated aim is, of course. Um, and, and as I just indicated, organizations that have been researching this I've pointed this out. I mean, there's no evidence of it actually being effective um, in, in terms of, of, of cybercrime uh, fighting. And, and I mean, just to, you know, the, the facts are, while these systems, these SIM card registration and, and data retention systems have been introduced um, over the last two decades and, and for the last decade across the continent, cybercrime has just continued to go up. It's just continued to increase, and and uh, uh, so so they haven't been effective deterrent mechanisms in terms of cybercrime, um, and globally cybercrime is projected to 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 
increase exponentially and, and reach a, a, a global cost of over $10 trillion by 2025. It's increasing every year, the scope of cybercrime globally and across this continent. So while countries have been introducing these schemes and saying that they are going to um, uh, deter uh, cyber criminal activity, um, the, the evidence actually shows no, they aren't deterring criminals. Criminals have ways of, 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 uh, of working around these systems. Um, in fact, the Association for Progressive Communications in 2013 already stated, importantly, the justifications commonly given for some registration that it will assist in reducing the abuse of telecommunication services for the purpose of criminal and fraudulent activity are unfounded. SIM registration has not been effective in curbing crime and instead has fueled it. States, states which have adopted SIM card registration have seen the growth of identity-related crime and have witnessed black markets quickly pop up to serve as those wishing to remain anonymous. Uh, uh, SIMs can be illicitly cloned, criminal, or criminals can use foreign SIMs on roaming, roaming mode or, or internet and satellite telephony to circumvent SIM registration requirements. Now, criminals find ways to get around these systems. But what we are seeing, and there are, uh, there's a growing body of, 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 of reports and literature out there, is how governments are using, abusing this, especially on this continent. And the collaboration for international ICT policy in East and Southern Africa, which is based in Uganda, produces the annual uh, State of the in uh, of Internet Freedom in Africa report. And they annually show how SIM card registration and data retention systems are used to target journalists, uh, political opposition, um, civil society actors and organizations, um, and, and, and other groups that are critical of, of, of uh, the, uh, you know, the incumbent government in a, in a specific country, especially in repressive states. Now, there's a mentality here that you hear in a lot of the statements being made on this panel by the, by the, the, the uh, uh, state uh, operator, representatives of state operators and, and the police. And, and this, 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 this uh, is, is basically, if I could phrase it, it's basically one of, it can't, it can't happen here in Namibia. It won't happen here. Okay, Mr. This Lenz. This is happening in all these other countries. And, and, and I mean, we, one of as, as you, I, I as you are closing. The, the police representative indicated that um, there's a trust issue in Namibia. Yes, there's a big trust issue in Namibia around state institutions, and there's declining trust. Consecutive Afrobarometer show declining trust in government across the board. So in that context, the concerns around privacy, around oversight, around abuse are legitimate concerns, and the evidence out there across the continent around the world is, is overwhelming and uh, should be considered when we view these things. And, and I would encourage people to, to take a look at what, what has been written and what has been researched and the reports out there. They are available on there. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear us? You can't. Yeah, no, we... Or is he off? Okay, because I wanted to, to hear from him as to, of course, the point is made around how ineffective it is in deterring the commission of crime. But I wanted to hear with regards to the investigation phase thereof, whether it has become, been found to be useful or not. So if you, if you can hear us, that's the point that I would want you to close with uh, briefly. Uh, Mr. Lengs. Otherwise, we can proceed and close. Uh, Albertina, there are a few things that uh, you can speak to. Uh, it's uh, around your capabilities. Are you, are you able to withstand hacking and all these things? Uh, people that want to comply, again, let's reiterate that. What is it that they need to do as we are closing? Okay, so in closing, and I think to address the, um, the question regarding the hacking, I, I think my answer lies with the 
comment made from the gentleman, um, I, my apologies, I forgot your name, from the law firm, where he simply put it, criminals would do anything to bypass the law and find means to commit crime. And that's really what it is. Yes, there is best industry practice in terms of safeguarding um, information, but in this room, I think we are all aware that in as far as criminals are concerned, they'll find a way. Um, so that is one. Um, making sure that the data does not end up in the wrong hands and the safeguarding around that. I think I've addressed that before where uh, I've at least touched on the requirement to have designated persons within entities who um, deals with this information. So that's one of the ways in which the law is trying to ensure that the, the, the private data within the or in possession of these entities does not um, end up in the wrong hands, even within the entity itself. Um, then I think... If people do not have IDs, they don't have proof of residence, you don't register them. People without I and maybe perhaps uh, Rusa is best um, to address this, but I can try. People without IDs and proof of residence, one would note that the regulation in its current format has tried to address that and to at least accommodate uh, those members of our communities, whereby, for instance, if you do not have proof of residence, you can um, give the, the, the place where you receive your, your mail, your church, for instance, all of that can be used to indicate where more or less you live and that is acceptable at this stage. Okay, uh, patients maybe around the same lines as operators, uh, the safety, the hacking, withstanding hacking, and those that do not have these, the documents that you people are requiring. Okay, I'll start from the documents. Um, yeah, I, the regulations have definitely tried to cover as much as possible. Naturally, with any law, there's a few things a few people who probably would not be able to meet the requirements. But the place of residence, it can even be a letter from a traditional chief, as an example. So it's really gone as far as dealing with the people on the ground. From an MTC perspective, we've, we've introduced a biometric system that would be able to take your birth certificate, your name, and then take a photo of you in that system then has an identification of the person. So we are also trying to take as much as possible of how we can accommodate this. Um, from, from hacking. We're back at Biggie's! For Big Brother Niger season seven. Who will bring the heat? What shakeups will happen within this world? We'll be discussing everything. Don't miss the new season of The Buzz, Tuesdays and Saturdays from 7 p.m. only on Showmax. With never seen before snippets, interviews and reviews hosted by me, Poké Makinwa. Subscribe now at www.showmax. Um, the bank has your phone number. They know where you live. They have your ID. Your information is out there already. Um, the banks rely on our systems to keep your information secure. Who else is best placed to secure your information right now, which is, by the way, already out there? Um, I think there was a question on the Data Protection Act. Yes. It would be ideal for the Data Protection Act to be in place because the current bill currently at Parliament um, really has very good definitions of what needs to be kept confidential. And that's your name, where you are, IP address. So it really is aimed to protect you. And I think, if I may speak on behalf of you, Rosa, um, from a Ministry of ICT perspective, um, so part six is not yet operationalized. It will be operationalized in January 2023. The aim is to have the protection, Data Protection and Cybersecurity Act prior to that. Um, we hope that will be the case, but that is the intention. Um, gentlemen over there, you are already registered if you've lost your SIM card from an MTC perspective. What else haven't I covered? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Patience. Uh, Inspector Albert, let's deal with those uh, rogue police officers. How do you deal with them and how do you keep them in check? All right. Um, 
as police officers, we are charged with an obligation, of course, um, to observe professionalism um, and many other things, uh, given the position that we find ourselves in. Now, you'd realize that um, when you make an application to uh, request for uh, the data from the service providers such as MTC and TN, you fill in a search warrant that comprises of the officer's uh, details. On that document, there is a unique number that uh, one can use to identify who made the request to either MTC or MTN. Should we then now establish that there is a complaint that emanates from um, the search warrant that was obtained and it subsequently the information or data thereof was used um, in a manner that uh, plays the police, uh, Namibian police in a disgraceful uh, manner, would now have the Department of Discipline, which comprises of two uh, wings, criminal part as well as depa uh, departmental part. They will now commence with investigation, go to MTC or, T uh, or TN, because of course these two entities have uh, employee mechanism in place to be able to reflect, reflect back and give us um, information as to who made a certain um, application for a search warrant. After the investigation, we would then be able to establish who these police officers was. Now, from there we have a code of contact that is now put in place to safeguard the unbecoming uh, manner and behaviors from police officers. We are then going to employ such to ensure that those that are found, police officers that are found to be in conflict with the code of conduct of the Namibian police are uh, put to order, are uh, brought to books. So we are going to take steps uh, against them. Um, in conclusion, um, in as far as um, Article 13 is concerned with privacy, we should also understand that uh, an issue of national security cannot, um, uh, uh, privacy cannot supersede the interest of uh, national security when there is a question of national security, then the uh, uh, right of privacy to a certain individual should lay below the question of national security. So we are then saying we support this new development in a sense that it's going to be very instrumental in the investigations of crime. What The question that I want to leave with the, with the audience is this. Um, in 2009, if I remember very well, there are two American citizens that flew from America to Namibia. They then subsequently ex executed a Namibian that was studying in, in America. I can't remember his name, but the two accused are Townsend, Kevin Townsend Marcus. I cannot remember his full name. How, what led to their arrest? It's through the communication that they've made with the disease. Now, the question to the audience is that, are we then going to keep objecting the new development so we leave a loophole that would now give foreigners an opportunity to come in our country and do whatever they, and do whatever they want and live without being traced? So we are saying that with the new development, we'll be able to trace that A, party A, made a, a contact with part B that will be very instrumental in our investigations and it will speed the process of apprehending the culprit. Thank you. Wow, thank you. What a close. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Apollos, uh, when you started, you spoke about that we should also have regard to the how. Uh, has the, the discussion informed us, enriched us as to how it is going to be done, and is it comforting? Um, not really. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I, I think um, what matters um, at the moment is just... Um, the fact that there are um, there's a penalty, uh, penalty clause, um, and um, I think um, you know this is a new legislation and um, can always be amended as time goes and um, you know as um, uh, people learn from practice. And um, I, I just wanted to to make a comment on um, I think on one aspect that uh, Mr. Links uh, touched on. He said that. Um, it would seem like uh, cybercrime is still just on the increase, uh, despite all these legislations. Um, I, I do not know the extent of the research he did, 
Um, and whether or not really, you know, that is the position that, you know, the statistics are that uh, cybercrime is, is, is um, increasing. But uh, my, my comment is that um, uh, obviously I think uh, the gentleman over there made the comment that they are criminals. That is their job. So obviously we expect them to do these things. It will not be a normal society if they don't. Uh, but it does not mean that just because you know that they'll keep doing it, you must just fold your hands and say, listen, let it go. I think... Yeah, right. that, that's it for me. Uh, Karen, let's come in there. Uh, when you spoke last, you appear to have been on the fence. Uh, has that position changed anyway? Uh, do you think it's, a, it's good provisions? Uh, does it accord with the provisions of Article 13? What are your views? Um, so, um, the fact is that there is provision made. Penalties are um, set forth um, for people or entities um, stepping over the lines or abuse in power. And um, we have, s the thing is that most of the laws should, n the intrusion should not be unlawful. So limitations should be set, um, I think, and yeah, so we stand, it's a hard topic to decide, should it not be, should it be. Um, but a limitation should be set in, um, more regulation, um, limiting criminals, um, especially having people controlling the media and the data, protecting it, um, because a lot of people's lives are at stake as well. So it's a necessity, so... Yeah. All right. Rusa, let me end with you. Uh, and there was a suggestion from the floor. How about an uh, information or data ombudsman in the equation so that we get some level of comfort and not hearing Grant telling us this is what happened, the police telling us they've implemented it to the core. Let's, some other assurances. Um, okay, that, that sounds interesting. I think that's an... Uh, an, an a discussion that the relevant stakeholders and the office of the ombudsman or the relevant bodies that have the power to create such institution perhaps should um, um, uh, discuss. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel, please give him a round of applause. <laughs> I, I can only thank them for the insight that they have provided. I think without any fear of contradiction, we are definitely enriched. The way we walked in here, and as we are living now, the information that has been shared with us will really come to our assistance. I can also just thank you for your participation. Uh, questions, uh, some very hard hitting and direct. Uh, that's the essence of, the, of any discussion. So let me thank you so much. But for the organizers, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to handle this one. I hope I've lived up to your expectations. Uh, and I wish you all the best as you are concluding your legal studies. All the best for the exams. Thank you. Now? Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Steve Derokave. Can you please give him a round of applause as well? Thank you so much to the panelists as well. I hope you guys also had fun. Thank you so much for coming. But I would like to welcome Mr. Tamba to give us our official vote of thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tamba Katumbo, and I'm, uh, as, men as she mentioned, nah, my name is Tamba Katumbo. <laughs> <laughs> and on behalf of our firm, Grocious, and our captain, I would like to offer my grat gratitude to all the speakers for sharing their insightful thoughts and opinions with us, and more especially for taking time out of their busy schedules to partake in the discussion. We have been fortunate to have a renowned identity from scholars, admitted legal practitioners, civil servants, as well as people people from the telecommunication fields. It has been an absolute honor to host you. 
We would also like to thank all the media houses present, more especially Desert FM, for live streaming the discussion on all their platforms. We acknowledge your effort in making sure that this significant matter reaches as many Namibians as possible. <clears throat> to the lovely audience, a panel discussion is nothing without you. Thank you for showing up and for representing your valuable views. To my fellow students, your presence is a reflection of the seriousness and relevance of this discussion. Your opinions have been heard and will definitely mold public perception. Lastly, but surely not least, I would like to thank Mrs. Hamalungu, in her absence, I think, and my team. A few months ago, this all seemed like a mammoth task. Not only have we completed our mandate, but we've managed to actually uh, raise awareness regarding something important and controversial. I'm proud of each and every one of you. I thank you once again. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We have come to the end of our program. So thank you all, and have a great night. And the panelists, please stay for five minutes. Okay.